I think that a lot of people might actually get their first sort of onboarding into VR-like experiences through audio-first experiences. Welcome to Structural Shifts by Aperture, a bi-weekly show that radically reimagines the future of work, society, and business. We take a devil's advocate approach to exploring the massive shifts transforming our economies and our world, and our guests are not afraid to challenge the status quo. To learn more about Aperture, visit apertureHub.co. You may have heard that Spotify recently made a $100 million licensing deal with Joe Rogan for exclusive streaming rights of his podcast, The Joe Rogan Experience, which is the most listened to podcast out there. Earlier this year, Spotify bought the podcast network, The Ringer. And last year, they bought podcast production company, Gimlet Media, and also the podcasting app, Anchor. Our guest today is Brett Bivens, and he is going to talk about why he is so optimistic about Spotify and how the future of audio will be a social experience with different network effects. Brett is a venture investor at TechNexus, an early stage venture capital firm based in Chicago, although Brett is in France. One of the core investment areas for TechNexus is audio and media. And so in this episode, you'll hear Brett talking about that with your host, Ben Robinson. They also get into how external investors can get an accurate picture of a company's culture. They talk about the various words and phrases Brett has called including escape velocity and clampetition. They talk about the increased focus of psychology and wellness during the pandemic and how this could change the way we design cities, consume media and prioritize work and more. Let's jump right into our conversation with Ben and Brett. So you work in venture capital. The home of venture capital is the United States. Uh, you yourself are American. So, so why, why practice the, the trade from Paris? Yeah, it's a good question. I think the the first thing is that our investment model kind of dictates it to a degree. So we work with a number of large corporates across industries, and these companies all have global businesses. And so as they think about what the future of their company looks like, they they need access to the global innovation ecosystem. And so from day one, we've always had a very kind of geographically agnostic perspective on where we want to invest and the types of companies that we want to work with. And, you know, on top of that, I think we really do buy into the idea that great companies are being built everywhere and have been, you know, being built everywhere. Um, And so that was that was a big part of it was, you know, trying to now, given that we've seen so much talent and so many great companies built in Europe, get a little bit more involved over here. And and then why Paris specifically? Uh, So partially family. I, my wife is from France. Uh, I'd spent a lot of time over here, kind of building relationships, following the ecosystem. I was getting just really excited about what was happening with the types of companies that were being built here. So it was kind of just natural that it that it worked out that way. And it turns out actually that the first investment that we made uh, through this model that we have at TechNexus about three or four years ago was a company founded by French founders, partially based in the US, partially based in in France. And so that kind of gave us a perspective as well on sort of this distributed nature of teams that were being built. So yeah, so that's kind of why I ended up here. Our team is is still based in the US and we invest uh, in the US, North America and Europe. We could argue that France is doing, you know, within Europe is probably one of the hottest ecosystems, right? So yep. I think I read that like VC money going into, into French tech is up something like 5X, right? Since 2014. So was it was it i suppose as you said right it was a bit because of family and but was it also because you you think you know paris is increasingly becoming you know the the sort of hottest or the you know the hub for for tech in in europe i think so i think there's great things that you could say about any of the ecosystems in europe uh, you know berlin obviously has has some incredible companies that have come out of there the the cities and the the countries in the Nordics, uh, just kind of incredible sort of per capita output of innovation. And then obviously London being sort of the centerpiece of the, the European tech ecosystem. But yeah, Paris, uh, you know, we, again, we're just really excited about the the companies that we were seeing here, the attention that was being paid to the, uh, the region and the ecosystem by investors. And, you know, even a, apart from apart from all of all of that kind of stuff, even at later stages, so sort of beyond where we invest, we were seeing a tremendous amount of talent kind of flow into the ecosystem from all over the world to you know launch uh, launch Europe for U- American companies and doing that from Paris or joining teams in Paris, leaving Silicon Valley companies to do that here. So we sort of saw this confluence of things, all of these all of these different things, capital and talent and attention, and even kind of governmental resources being poured in that. Uh, just got us really excited about where the ecosystem was headed. 
wanted to get you next on Spotify, right? Because um, for, for anybody who subscribes to your newsletter, it's a company that you sort of, you know, you focus on almost disproportionately, right? And you, and you're, and you yourself have said you're an investor in it. And you, you know, it's obvious you're really excited about the prospects for Spotify. But if you listen to most commentators on Spotify, most of them sort of see it as a company that has, you know, qu- quite difficult unit economics, right? Low gross margins, high variable costs, and and a company that's up against, you know, really deep pocketed competitors. And so, wh- why is it that what why is it that you rate Spotify so highly? Yeah, so I think the the reason that I focus on it so much, um, there, there's a few reasons. So one, I sort of see it as emblematic or uh, as an embodiment of of what's kind of happening to European tech in this world, where you have the American tech giants and the Chinese tech giants kind of uh, squeezing it out and seeing sort of where where that lands. And so I find that kind of interesting. At the same time, at TechNexus, one of the core investment areas for us has always been audio and media, and we have a large portfolio of companies there. And so it's just natural that uh, kind of follow that space, try to understand the key players in that market. And I think Spotify is a very central company in the sense that they have to work with and integrate with and serve different uh, different stakeholders across all different parts of the audio uh, ecosystem and value chain. And so from that perspective, that that kind of speaks to why I follow the company so closely. In terms of my optimism about it and sort of how I see them fitting into the broader picture, I think you're you're spot on. I mean, any anytime a company puts a competitor slide up or you build a competitor slide for a company, it includes Apple and Amazon and Google and yeah. Tencent and ByteDance with TikTok. It's a, it's a little bit scary. I think that Spotify has done a, a very good job of delivering a differentiated user experience within the limitations that they have. I mean, I think we... It's it's well known at this point that they you know they have a tough supplier relationship with uh, with the record labels and that's kind of slowed down their ability to innovate. Like you said, that flows through to to their margins and and the way that the business kind of functions. Um, so I would say I'm sort of cautiously optimistic. I think they've done a lot of really great things as a company. I think they have a lot of hills to climb. Um, but that that optimism and sort of the the upshot of what I think Spotify can be in the future is is really just as much about my excitement about where audio is going. And what's sort of evolving within the audio ecosystem? You know, I think for a lot of the same reasons that a company like Spotify has been forced to innovate rather slowly, I think it's just true of the the broader ecosystem as well. So, I think we often kind of underrate like path dependency in the way that technology is adopted, and the audio ecosystem has had that play out in spades with regards to again the record labels and the way that Apple has sort of been an early mover on podcasts and not really done anything there, but their sort of scale and size has scared a lot of people away from doing anything interesting there. Same thing has happened in like audiobooks with Amazon. People are kind of scared away from that. And so it's sort of slowed down innovation in the ecosystem, but we're starting to see different things break through and different user experiences develop. You know, we're getting new technologies coming to market like AirPods and voice interfaces that are, I would say, like expanding the addressable daily hours for audio content to be accessed. So creating more social opportunities for audio, creating more uh, contextual opportunities for audio and kind of having it always with us. So we're on this path almost to like an ambient audio experience where, you know, in a very, I guess, optimistic reading of what the future looks like, we have these different audio experiences and scenes and technologies that can be sort of applied to whatever activity we're undertaking at the time to just kind of improve our daily lives. And so you know, that's kind of the upshot for Spotify and for the company in audio. The engagement surface area just kind of continues to expand, monetization catches up, and they continue to uh, deliver good user experiences along the way and incrementally innovate. And so, yeah, so that's that's kind of how I view Spotify and the broader audio market in general, I'd say. Yeah, I think you, 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 there was one really pithy statement in one of your in one of your essays, right? I think it was something like, the ear is under-monetized. Uh, vis-a-vis the eye, right? And I think that's a pretty good starting point to, to, to start to look at the companies in this space. Yeah. And that, you know, I think that came from Daniel Eck, the CEO of Spotify, but it's something that a lot of other executives in the industry have sort of echoed. You know, you have podcasts that really haven't had sort of internet scale advertising applied to them. Yeah. They've always been sort of this hobbyist kind of enterprise where the host reads their own ads and um, it's not particularly programmatic, not particularly scalable, which has kept a lot of you know large brands and companies that are going to spend millions and millions of dollars on advertising through some medium kind of out or you know just barely dipping their toes in the water. And so, yeah, I think we're starting to see that all catch up. We're starting to see 
social experiences uh, catch up in a in a significant degree. I mean, not to not to dip too far into the uh, I guess tech. Twitter topic du jour, but a company like Clubhouse, which uh, you know recently raised money from Andreessen Horowitz at a pretty lofty valuation, or people people think it's a pretty lofty valuation, kind of gets at this as well, which is you know audio as a social experience and the different sort of network effects that can be driven through that. You talk a lot about patient investing, right, in in the context of Spotify, and I think you like your the term you use is something like you know they have a different investment horizon right and um compared to some of their competitors is that through design or is that because you know you you almost have to patiently invest because you have to stealthily invest because your competitors are so powerful it seems like a little bit of both i mean as a total outsider to the company and not really knowing the you know the inner working so much um you know i do get a sense from hearing executives talk and people like Daniel, like the CEO talk, that there is just sort of this cultural patience to the way that the company thinks about building this business and, you know, the long-term opportunity that they're going after. So again, without knowing anything from the inside, that's kind of how I perceive their culture a little bit to be. But yeah, I think that, you know, because of the fact that they are squeezed in the middle of all of these different, uh, these different powerhouses, these different monopolies, basically, they have to tread lightly and carefully and sort of eke out what they can over time. You know, they've maybe been uh, forced to slow play their hand in social because of what that might, uh, the friction that might create with record labels who think they're trying to go around them. Same thing with, you know, Spotify going direct to artists and working directly with artists. They probably had to slow play that a little bit, you know, their relationship with, you know, platforms like Apple or uh, like Google, where they're reliant on those platforms for distribution to a degree through the app store, but they're also directly competitive with them, creates some challenges. So yeah, I think it's, I think it's, a little bit of both, and they probably feed off of each other. It's by design, it's baked into the culture, but it's also just inherent in the business model and how they have to operate. And do you think they need to win the podcasting war in order to have a re, you know, to ch- completely change the unit economics of their business? I think so. I, I think that that's one piece of it. I think that that's only one piece of it. There's there's so much more, and I think that there's an interesting uh, comment that that I heard once, and I, I agree with, and that's to say that you know a category isn't really one until a social product emerges, and I think that. That is kind of the the long term play for a company like Spotify is to have a more social component to their business. But to get there, I do think that they, you know, they need to continue to innovate across these different categories and continue to expand beyond music to podcasts to books to health and wellness to all of these different all of these different categories that uh, help them build up that that user demand and help them build up the leverage against all of the people that they're sort of working against in the industry uh, to then layer on additional social experiences. And is is it the importance of social experiences? Um, is that what thinks makes you think that a marriage with between Spotify and Snap might be a good idea? Because it's, it's just it's, yeah. you're the only person I've ever seen sort of, you know, put those two names together as a potential um, you know, merger. And I just, yeah. I was just qu- quite curious about that. Yeah. Well, you know, it was sort of a throwaway comment at first in response to, to that, what I just said, which was this, this idea that a category isn't one until a social product emerges. And like I said, I agree with that. Um, and I don't think it's likely at all that that would happen, but it does get you to start thinking about, again, the evolution of audio and social media, how they come together as well as immersive reality, virtual reality, and how all of the, these things converge at some point in the future. I mean, I think that uh, most people look to gaming as, as sort of like the first path for immersive social media. And they're definitely not wrong about that. I mean, we're seeing that play out in real time with things like Fortnite and these massive games that have created virtual universes. But, you know, if we think about the things that sort of create immersive kind of these metaverse like experiences, even even on a partial basis, and you have things like, you know, persistent worlds and synchronous collaboration and communication and you know, the ability for the platform to be populated by content that's created by a wide range of contributors and even interoperability across platforms. I think all of those things uh, work well with audio. And so I think that, you know, a lot of people might actually get their first sort of uh, onboarding into VR-like experiences through audio first experiences. And that's where, you know, Snap as this AR and VR company, they do some really interesting things there. Spotify as a, as a, audio company. I think there's there's some interesting tie-ins there that just get you thinking about what the future of the, the media market looks like. But no, I don't think it's likely. As I was saying to you earlier on, I've, you know, I, I read all of your newsletters in one go. I mean, I've read many of them before, but then I read them all in one go. And the thing that's um, striking is just how many sort of terms you seem to have 
coined, right? It's like it's, it's like you know you have your own personal lexical lexical set, right? And um, so I'm just going to get you. I'm just if you don't mind, I'm just going to like ask you about some of these terms, what they mean, and so I'll do one now, and then I think later in the podcast, I, I, like we'll cover a couple of others. The first one I, I wanted to cover was escape velocity. What do you mean by escape velocity? Yeah, so. A couple of weeks ago, or maybe, uh, yeah, whenever it was, there's an investor named Gavin Baker, who is a growth and public market technology investor, has really, really interesting thoughts about just the development of a lot of the things that that I know you think about and that I think about. And he wrote a piece talking about the two things that he looks at uh, when evaluating competitive advantage for consumer internet companies, and those things being scale and loyalty. Um, and those are really the only two ways to sort of get out of this rat race where you're paying Facebook and Google, you know, forty percent of uh, venture capital dollars that come in, or some massive, you know, massive uh, amount of money every year to sort of just maintain your your growth and your customers. And so, for me, that brought up the the next question of what does a company have to do in order to achieve the level of loyalty that allows them to generate word of mouth acquisition, lower their customer acquisition costs, um, create long-term stickiness in a product. And then how do you translate that into scaling without losing the essence of sort of what helped you get to that loyalty in the first place? Because that's something that I think constantly happens is there's this, there's this balance between, you know, being a great product or a great platform for your core customers versus going broad and scaling and, alienating that core customer set. And so it's a it's a delicate balance. And I think it internet escape velocity is sort of just a way of thinking about that. You know, it's not a thing that I necessarily have a, a prescription for. I think there's a lot of elements that play into it. It depends heavily on the business model and the stage of the company. But it is just a way to to sort of think about, okay, how do we what are the factors that allow us to build, you know, community and build uh, word of mouth and build that stickiness. What are the kind of technical features for how we can serve customers, you know, if behavior changes or if, you know, as, as new competitors come into the market, what are the sort of core features? What are the way that we stay aligned with our customers from a product and technology perspective? And then what are the areas of new business that we can go into that keep us aligned with those customers, but don't sacrifice things like margins and profitability long term. And so it's it's kind of a loaded analysis to try to do. And again, it's very different for every company. So it's not necessarily a prescriptive thing, but I think it's important for companies, for investors to kind of think about if scale and loyalty are the two strongest drivers of competitive advantage for consumer internet companies, what are the core elements that sort of underlie those things and allow you to reach those two uh, two points? And you, and you say it's not prescriptive, but you do set out sort of three almost preconditions, right? Yeah, I, I can. Yeah, I can. I'm certainly happy to to sort of walk through those. And and you know, I think the the notion of responsive instrumentation sort of gets to this idea of loyalty. And there's there's a you know one company that I talk about in the piece, uh, Lululemon, who I think demonstrates this extremely well. It's this idea of again being able to quickly adjust from an operational perspective from a product perspective, being able to make sure you meet your customers where you are and stay aligned with your customers. And no matter what the situation is, uh, deliver on your brand promise. And they're an example of a company that, you know, in this kind of crazy time that we're in right now, where, you know, their stores have closed and uh, people aren't going to yoga studios anymore, they need to figure out how do they continue to engage those customers? How do they continue to deliver on the brand promise that they've, that they've sort of uh, always offered? And, you know, one of the things that they've done early on, and again, this isn't a you're all for every company, but it's worked for them is sort of this idea of vertical integration, owning the entire, uh, the entire value chain that they, that they use to deliver their product. So they, you know, have a very direct and strict product focus. They don't have this broad range trying to serve every type of customer. They, uh, they manage and run and own their own stores. And so they've been able to turn those retail locations into distribution um, outlets and you know they've been early, maybe not early, but they've been active in understanding uh, digital content and how they can use that to further engage their customers. And so it's sort of this, uh, I guess, a, a short way of saying it's it's adaptability. So it's yeah. it's the ability to adapt when when situations change rapidly. The, another one was business model leverage, I think, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and that's that's sort of uh, you know I, I guess goes back to Spotify a little bit when you I think that's a company that that has pretty interesting business model leverage. And the way that I think about business model leverage is you sort of build up your core business on what might be considered low margin or whatever maybe, but a low margin business that 
presents opportunities for you to then scale in a way that helps you expand margin or sets you up to at least scale in a way that helps you maintain margin. And so when I think of Spotify with that, we talked a little about it, about it earlier, but it's this low gross margin kind of streaming business where they're paying a ton of money to the labels, but over time as they expand and gain leverage, podcasts are a higher margin business, social products are a higher margin business, marketplace products are a higher margin business for them. And so uh, by owning the consumer demand via the lower margin streaming business, they have the opportunity to expand into those areas. Lululemon, I, as I talked about, sort of a similar company. They have a high margin business to begin with relative to peers, but because of the fact that they've you know, invested in digital, they've uh, invested in all of these community level features. They also have additional areas to grow that help them maintain their their high margin status. So um, there's probably a million other companies that, that do these types of things particularly well, but uh, those are two that kind of come to mind there. I'm going to quote to you from one of your essays here, right? You, you wrote, company culture is the bridge between theory and action. It is the oper- operationalization of a company's values and it expresses itself as a set of frameworks that a company uses to make decisions under ins- under uncertainty. You know, I thought that was a really eloquent definition of culture. It's, it's clear that culture is really important for you when you assess companies you invest in. But, how, you know, how practically is, or how easy is it for you and how practical is it for you as an outsider, as an external investor, to get a really good gauge over a company's culture, whether, you know, it's private or whether it's public? Good question, and it's a it's a challenging thing to assess. Quite frankly, I think, especially in a in a world like venture capital, where at times you don't have full control necessarily over the timeline in which you get to invest. You know, there are uh, companies that that raise funding rounds, and and maybe the opportunity doesn't exist for too long, and so you have to figure out a way to to build that conviction and build uh, build an understanding of that culture very quickly. Um, you know, I think that there's there's a few. A few ways, uh, and this is not comprehensive by any means, and I think everybody has their own way of assessing these things. But when I think about it from our perspective as early stage venture investors, you know, we're often um, trying to understand a few things. I mean, if there's a if there's a team that's already been, been built up around the core founders, it's always helpful to sort of understand why the the next person, why that you know that first engineer, first salesperson, or whoever are kind of some of the more recent people to the team, why they've joined the team, you know, why why they're excited about the mission, what that mission is in their mind, does that mission align with what you're hearing from the founders that you're talking to? And and really is there this kind of true north that the whole company is pushing towards? I think that's one interesting way that that we sort of try to try to test for that and solve for that. And that sort of gets back a little bit to this idea of alignment with with customers and being very customer centric I think if companies are uh, very clearly focused first and foremost on delivering the kind of value uh, like that to to customers that can be a hint of a, of a really strong uh, culture and an aligned culture and then you know when for us as, as early stage investors it really does come down to the founding team and the way that they set the vision for the company and the way that they think about culture and so one of the things that we always sort of talk about, and I think is is an interesting way to frame it, maybe, is uh, followability. It's it's this idea of are these people that are leading this company that have founded this company, maybe key early executives, are they going to be able to attract and retain talent and capital and customers and tell a story and stay true to that story personally uh, that that is going to help them compete over the long term. And so that's, you know, a few a few different ways that we sort of look at it and and think about it, but I think regardless whether it's an early stage company that you have access to, whether it's a a growth stage company or a public company, it's always a challenging thing to really suss out how that, you know, how that plays out. And how important is it relative to everything else? You know, so for example, if you came across a company and you love the business model, you know, you're really comfortable with unit economics, it had responsive imp- instrumentation, it had, um, you know, business model leverage, but you didn't break the culture. Would that, would that be a red flag that would lead you to potentially not invest? Absolutely. I think that, you know, for, for us as early stage investors, all of those things are important. You know, there's always the, there's always the sort of, Hey, is the is the product great? Is the market great? Is the team great? And and how do you sort of weight all of those? And the answer is it's it kind of depends on the company and and the market and everything like that. But yeah, for us, it's it's kind of a that's that's the first checkpoint. Is is this a team with whom we have kind of intellectual and emotional alignment on where they're going as a business? Um, because all of those other things can fall apart very very quickly if you don't have the culture right, if you don't have the leadership right. You know, product decisions can go awry. Um, new market development can certainly go awry. 
talent and how you keep that around uh, that's so core to building the business can can sort of go awry. And so I, I always think that, yes, I, the culture and the leadership team at the early stage is so, so critical to making sure that the, the right market is captured and the right product is built and, um, yeah, and the right strategy is applied for the long term. Just another question on investing. So you, wh- one of the articles, I, I mean, I really enjoyed reading at the time and then I also really enjoyed rereading it at the weekend, is, was the one about bottom-up versus you know, top-down or thesis-driven investing. It sounds like you see the thesis as the sort of you know, marketing narrative and then the bottom-up stuff is the, is the sort of you know, the hard work you need to do to actually arrive at the right solution. So it's almost like the thesis gets you, the thesis helps you to raise money and the bottoms up investing helps you to deploy the money, and you shouldn't confuse the two almost. Yeah, I think that's I think that's true. Um, you know, I think that even even applying thematic investing at, at an operational level is is totally fine. I mean, there's a circle of competence element to it where you know if you're truly just saying I'm going to invest in everything, uh, there's there's challenges with that as well. So there's a give and a take. You know, I'm, I'm certainly hope that that's the case that there can be sort of those two uh, opposing forces at once, just because that's. Uh, as you sort of mentioned with Spotify and the way that we invest in our funds, this vertical focus that that kind of develops. But you're right, the the investment thesis and the way that you sort of talk about where you invest in the venture capital world surely uh, becomes sort of a, a marketing vehicle, a way for you to tell the market who you are and what you stand for and how you think and all of these different things. The challenge comes when you start to uh, sort of overly believe your own view of the future and. Yeah. Uh, close your mind off to the maybe the ideas that that founders are coming to the table with and some of the emergent opportunities that develop in the ecosystem and that's really where the the um, kind of friction comes in between this bottoms up investing and being overly thematic um, I think that if you're trying to predict the future and, and do all of that I mean that's kind of the the job of the founder in my opinion and the team that's kind of building the company so that's that's definitely kind of the way that the way that I think about that. And it sounds like you shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't sort of shut yourself off from opportunistic opportunities as well by being too, too sticking too rigidly to to a, to a thesis, you know. And I just wondered, like, does that happen to you? I mean, do you, so as much as you, you know, you do have a at least sectors you prefer, and you know, and business models you prefer. I guess you've had instances of where you know a founders pitched you, and you've even though it wasn't something that was particularly on your radar, you were sort of you know struck by the passion and the and, and the vision and you know, the team and maybe, you know, like, would you, would you argue that it's almost unhealthy to, you know, to deny yourself the, the chance of being opportunistic? Oh yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, it's, it's something that, uh, that I think about a lot and our team kind of thinks about a lot because we do have, you know, a, a handful of different verticals that we focus on different funds that are completely divergent from one another. And I mentioned audio quite a bit. We, do a lot in uh, travel and recreation and public safety and industrial markets. And so we're sort of touching all these different areas. And I, I, I think that's exactly right. I mean, this, this idea of thinking about new technologies, new business models that founders are coming to you with new angles for how to, how to bring a product to market. Um, it's benefited by this broader approach of understanding, okay, what, what did we see over here in this market that worked or didn't work? And how can we apply it to this completely different area? And if you do just get overly rigid, you uh, you kind of miss out on those opportunities for, I guess, transfer learning in a way. I think we've done an amazing job because we've, you know, we're at the halfway point. And we haven't talked about the pandemic yet. So, so, <laughs> so uh, yeah, ha- uh, hat tip to us. But I'm g- I am actually going to start to steer us in that direction now by asking you about remote work. You wrote an essay on remote work. And you know, if I were to sort of summarize it, um, badly, by the way, if I, but if I were to sort of try to summarize it, it's, your view is that a lot of the sort of easy, you know, quote unquote, easy solutions to re- remote work have been tackled. But yeah, you know, we're, we're only at the very sort of, you know, early stages of starting to tackle some of the harder aspects of, of remote work. And so I suppose the question is, what are those harder aspects and, or, and those harder problems that we need to solve? You know the the thing about remote work and distributed work is it's it's very challenging to crack as a company that's trying to do it well and as a company that's trying to build products and services for uh, for that market. And so because it's been so hard to do historically as a as a company, um, and really you know many have shied away from from actually even trying it until the pandemic sort of hit. Maybe the the addressable market hasn't been big enough, or companies looked to build solutions that could be you know, purchased and used by uh, companies that were, you know, maybe trying remote, but also had people in an office. And so 
you you had that uh, effect in play. Um, you also had the fact that a lot of the easy things, you know, we talk about video conferencing and all of these different tools that we're using for remote work. Every company and every use case is so idiosyncratic that it's easy to say, oh, well, this doesn't work. This doesn't work. Uh, so I'm going to build to sort of scratch my own itch here, which is great. I mean, it's a it's how a lot of great innovation occurs. So that that was kind of the I think the reason that a lot of these easy solutions get a lot of attention and a lot of traction. Um, they're maybe fun to play with and test out and and uh, are buzzy. But um, you're yeah, you're right about the the hard solutions. And I think that's something that hasn't been paid uh, enough attention to until I would say before the pandemic. I think it was really becoming clear for a lot of companies who were trying this and a lot of onlookers who were starting to spend more time thinking about how distributed work would develop that there were a lot of kind of infrastructural things, um, you know, whether that's around how do you do payroll uh, across borders for a company. Uh, without having, you know, without being this massive Fortune 500 company that has teams of lawyers and regulatory people who can handle that kind of stuff, or how do you how do you manage insurance across countries? How do you handle uh, security, cybersecurity for people that are working from home now? One of the things that I think has really come to a head with this pandemic is just sort of mental health and how do you how do you manage sort of the psychology and wellness of all of the people that are. Um, that are working in this in this situation, uh, and so I think all of those challenges present new opportunities for companies. That in the past, you know, maybe the sort of it didn't seem like it was worth it to go through all the legal and regulatory headache because you couldn't really predict when we were going to hit that inflection point and really start seeing that curve go up super super fast in terms of adoption of distributed work. But we're kind of there now. I think uh, you know every every day there's a new news item that comes out about X Y Z massive company is letting employees work from home forever. Uh, and so the the reality is that the market, so to speak, is big enough for people to go after now. And I think we'll see a, yeah, a massive amount of innovation happening there. And you know, the good thing is there's a lot of companies already that have been doing great stuff there for a while to to kind of you know build out that that infrastructure layer. Listening to you, it's almost like what you're saying is. You know, we've all got very excited about the first order effects, right? So, you know, we need to work from home, therefore, you know, we need to communicate, therefore, you know, um, by Zoom, you know, let's get excited about video conferencing. And what you're saying is actually there's second and third order effects, you know, if, in terms of, you know, stuff that are potentially overlooked at first, right? So like mental health. So beyond just remote working, what, what, what do you think are some of the soft, you know, most interesting second order, third order effects of what's happening with the pandemic? I think if I'm going to answer this honestly, I'll, I'll kind of answer with a non-answer in in saying, you know, I don't think any of us can know at this point, but I do think that you're right. There are there are these really interesting second and third order effects that are that are going to occur. That you know, as investors, as analysts, as you know, people watching this space, you almost just have to really uh, keep your keep your eyes open, keep an open mind towards you know how how demand is trending uh, in these different areas. Uh, some of the things that are some of the things that are changing. You know, I think that a couple areas that I think of that will be ripe for uh, interesting things to happen. Certainly, cities uh, is is one. Certainly, you know the uh, and that that means both in terms of transportation and mobility, but also in terms of retail and uh, physical locations of uh, of course offices and stores and and things like that. You know, there's there's sort of this interesting potentially nonlinear sort of jump that might occur as a lot of small businesses are going out of business and what happens when we need to start kind of backfilling that and people are reopening restaurants or starting new restaurants or trying to start new gyms or what is what does that new uh, new experience look like how does it now bridge digital and physical experiences uh, in a different way than maybe before so you know I think there's a lot of things to kind of look out for there but I guess the the short answer would be it's tough to, tough to say. And do, are you excited as an investor about because you know it's as as we know right it's it's difficult to displace incumbent organizations right whether it's you know whether it's Facebook or whether it's you know a local restaurant you know I suppose it's even harder if it's you know an online company but yep. but what 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 we're seeing is like you know this one off sort of discordant event right this discontinuity which must therefore create opportunities for companies to, to, to move in and do something different. And so is it, it, are, you, are you very excited? I mean, it, like, it seems almost sort of paradoxical to ask if you're excited at a time of pandemic, mm -hmm. but do you, are you sort of very optimistic about the, you know, the, the silver lining, the opportunities that will come out of this? There's a really interesting sort of term that I learned about a couple of months ago called accumulated accidents, uh, which originated with uh, a sort of an analyst and a writer named Clay Shirky. And it basically prompts us to sort of say about different 
societal behaviors or institutions, you know, whether this is actually representative of sort of an ideal expression of society or whether it's sort of built upon a series of accidents that can actually be unwound in the right circumstances. And, yeah. you know, it, it really, and if for lack of a better term, it's, it's creative destruction. It's how, it's how new innovation comes to market. And, you know, in a lot of cases, you can unwind some of these accidents via a better business model or via better technology. But some of the really, really big things, some of the things that we've, you know, really screwed up in the past that have sort of just accumulated on themselves and where incumbent interests have become extremely entrenched and difficult to, to sort of pull away. I think that's what this crisis is giving us an opportunity to rethink and, and reset with. You know, I think about healthcare in the United States and just sort of the, the uh, layer upon layer upon layer of difficult things to unwind uh, with that that we hadn't been able to do forever that are now just becoming completely undone with uh, consumer products playing the role of um, helping early warning and uh, telemedicine and regulations coming down there and sort of things that things that could never have been done without this. And so does that create an opportunity for a reset? I think it does in really interesting ways. Same thing with higher education and uh, you know, doing doing a lot with being more precise in, in helping people learn uh, at their own pace on their own schedule in a way that aligns with what they want to accomplish um, throughout life. You know, whether that's at an elementary level or adults that are uh, needing to change careers and do things there. And so, I think that we're in a, at a unique opportunity where we have you know business model innovation that can come to market, technology innovation that can come to market. And this massive catalyzing force, which is yeah. in our face on a daily basis, that's saying, you know, you need to change because the the world as you knew it does not represent sort of this ideal state. It even and and you may have known that, but now you have the opportunity to to actually take action and and move in the right direction. I thought one of the one of the interesting points you made in in one of your essays was that I think you called it a daily active crisis, right? So this is just providing air cover if you like, mm -hmm. to, for innovation in a way that we haven't seen. And, and you, you draw the distinction from climate change, which is clearly, you know, a more pressing issue than the pandemic, but it can't achieve this the, the same headspace, the same focus with, you know, regulators and innovators and, and business people because it doesn't have, it's not a daily active crisis. It's something that, you know, periodically we hear about, you know, a, a forest fire, we hear about mm -hmm. drought, but it's not every day in our consciousness in the way that this pandemic is. It's a bit of a damning statement on sort of human psychology and our inability to sort of plan for the long term and think about the future, I guess. But but yeah, I think that's just the reality of the of the situation without this kind of a crisis hitting us in the face, reminding us daily of the impact it's having on our lives. Uh, there's there's really less of a, an impetus for uh, for people at large to to really try to change their behavior and push for behavioral change. And you know, who knows? I mean, I, I think that we are the way that we are for good reason in a lot of ways. I don't think we're going to suddenly change overnight with this and start thinking uh, at a societal level much more about the future. I mean, that could be the case, but at the very least, you know, this can help us again reset and sort of at least at this point in time, do the right kind of planning for the future so that, you know, maybe we compound some, um, some happier accidents, I guess, in the future than, than what we've done in the past. Yeah. And, uh, and out of previous, you know, daily active crises, right. We've, we have achieved great things, right. So mm -hmm. um, I guess, you know, the second world war was a daily active crisis, right. Where, you know, we built, um, you know, the welfare state. I wanted to actually just take you back for a second to the, to the second order and third order effects of the pandemic. Not because it's almost like I don't want to let you off the hook, right? But it's just because I'm not asking you to necessarily make predictions, but I thought you had a really nice sort of framework for thinking about the future, which is what you call economic oceans. And, you know, and actually what we're talking about is we're actually talking about clusters of attention, you know, and so what businesses do you build that leverage those cluster, clusters of attention? Yeah, that's maybe a, a good thing to focus on this idea of, yeah, I've called them economic oceans. I like this oceans analogy to describe sort of the way that the way that attention is, is flowing in our world today, because, you know, we, we can't really think about the economy and, and everything that exists out there as, you know, defined by verticals or um, just specific areas, because there is so much overlap between uh, the the types of companies that are being built, the types of innovation that's being brought to market. I mean, I think if we look at all the companies that have been built over the last decade, maybe just a, a couple of a company like Square or Uber or even Zoom, they're sort of built at the intersection of 
these these different uh, these different pools of attention. You know, the way that we think about work, the way that we think about cities, the way that media is evolving, the way that commerce is evolving. None of those are industries in and of themselves, but they they're again sort of these uh, these areas where you know at the intersection of those things is where some really really interesting innovation can can kind of be created and i think that's you know more than anything as we think about sort of where where value gets created in the future it is less about predicting and it's more about sort of staying close to where those areas are overlapping and um you know how how for example to take to take one area how does how does sort of this uh new approach to wellness and, and well-being and, and sort of managing our health and understanding our health in the wake of this uh, change the way that cities are constructed or change the way that we consume media um, or, or change the way that we think about work and value work and prioritize work in our world. And so I think that there's going to be yeah some really interesting sort of bundling of, of these categories that, uh, that yeah, is, is sort of you know, not, not predictive and it's hard to say exactly how it's going to play out, but to try to focus on those intersections is maybe the right approach. Yeah, and I think that's very consistent with what you said earlier on, which is it's very difficult to to have a winning business model unless you've captured demand, right? Uh, or, or, or I think you said, what was the term? So uh, to, to introduce a business model without a social aspect, um, because it's almost that, right? I mean, like if we think about finance, for example, it doesn't have that social aspect. Therefore, it's you know it's a service that almost lends, you know, increasingly lends itself to be bundled with other activities within an economic ocean, right? Because it's in itself. It's obviously intrinsic to to economic activity, but it's not something that's where you have you know particularly strong right. um, s- you know social network effects, for example. Yeah, it's kind of the way that that any company on the internet sort of seems to trend is sort of those commoditized services get get bundled into a company that owns significant demand in one area or another. It's sort of like you know that you always hear the term every every SaaS company enter- enterprise SaaS company becomes a fintech company at some point because you get deeply enough integrated with the workflows of your customers that then you can start offering them just different features, different financial products, et cetera. And I think the same thing is, is happening in uh, the consumer internet world as well as, as you, uh, you know, you see the proliferation of digital wallets across the board with, you know, every company trying to offer them, thinking about how to offer them. Um, it's, it's sort of the same thing. So yeah, if you can, if you can identify the companies I think that are, that are, um, owning that demand and generating that demand. And I guess going back to that idea of generating intense loyalty from a customer base and finding the right ways to scale that loyalty, then you can really figure out where the where the next steps lie for that company and where the next features and monetization paths are. I want to ask you about another term, which I think is is yours. I think it's another one of yours of idioms, which is clampetition. What is clampetition? And can you give us an example? Because it's quite, it's again, it's quite specifically used at the moment, right? Within the pandemic, I think. Right. You, you sort of touched on it earlier where the, the pandemic has given a lot of companies sort of this cover to, to do different things or interesting things or sort of this carte blanche to, to do innovative stuff that they may have not had the boldness to do before. The way that I think about this term, clampetition, it's a, it's a word that just joins together competition and, and classiness, which is essentially companies using this totally disjointed economic situation to make moves that are, you know, classy in terms of helping their customers or helping their suppliers, but also double as these smart customer retention or acquisition tactics. And, you know, a lot of these moves are pretty, pretty minor. I mean, you, like I have probably gotten a million emails from companies saying here, our product is free for 30 days during the, during the pandemic or um, something like that, that are just really, you know, lightweight attempts to acquire new customers when they may not have otherwise had a channel to. Um, Zoom upgrading its education users to a free plan is, you know, one example of that. Um, there's others that are kind of run a lot more deep, uh, and I think the the food delivery space kind of provided like an early interesting model of that. So in the U.S. at least, um, you know, there's sort of these four companies that are are vying for the leadership role in that in that world, and it's Grubhub and Uber Eats and Postmates and DoorDash and uh, Grubhub is the only one of those companies that's actually profitable. Postmates and DoorDash are kind of these venture-backed companies that are burning a ton of cash. Uber Eats burns a ton of cash as well. And you know, DoorDash kind of used this opportunity to do something that their competitors couldn't because they're burning so much cash and have this sort of existential runway threat where Grubhub suspended commission payments from restaurants and uh, you know, was able to do that. And it was, you know, it's a classy move. It helps restaurants in theory sort of not have to pay and save working capital and things like that. But at the same time, it's pointed directly at their competitors and saying, we can kind of do a thing 
uh, that you can't. And hopefully that'll allow us to, you know, again, serve our customers better, acquire more customers, pull them away from you and hurt your business long term. So I think that's a, it's a type of thing that's been happening, you know, quite often uh, across the board. And it's just an interesting, yeah, interesting, unique thing that, that's, uh, that's been birthed by, by the pandemic. Square is another company that, you know, you've consistently been really bullish on, uh, uh, you know, and a company that where a bit like Spotify, I mean, maybe that's changing with Spotify and it's certainly changed with Square, but where for a long time you were sort of almost contrarian, right? In, in, in really rating the prospects for Spotify and for Square. Why is it again, you're bullish on Square and what, what have they done in terms of clan petition? Cause I think, you know, you used the example of, of Square a couple of times in the, in the essay. Yeah. So Square, I mean, really interesting company as well, just because they are one of those companies that has hit that kind of internet escape velocity state. They've, they've, driven so much demand with this cash app and they've just understood culture to such a degree and and have driven so much loyalty within that product that um, they actually, you know, their, their biggest kind of, uh, I guess, challenge or threat as a business right now is uh, their SMB customers just going out of business. Um, yeah. That's a massive threat for them. They're the type of company that has this sort of, we talked about responsive instrumentation, this ability to adjust incentives and just adjust operations in real time. Um, and because of the fact that they've built up this two-sided business where they've got SMB customers on one side, massive demand with Cash App on the other side, they can actually drive significant relief to those uh, SMB customers over time by doing things like offering rewards to their digital wallet customers for shopping at those places and recommending different, uh, you know, different Square SMB customers. So they can sort of be the uh, the force that drives the recovery of a lot of their customers. And, you know, I think that's a, a really, really interesting company um, to, to kind of keep, keep tabs on and follow. And yeah, very, you know, very bullish about sort of their, their prospects and where they're going. They're, they're almost a good example as well of, of patient investing, right? Because, you know, they started with that card reader that, you know, a lot of people sort of poo-pooed as, you know, just, you know, being, you know, sort of almost like perpetuating the same, right? Because it ran on all the same networks. Mm -hmm. And, but from there, they've, you know, they've, they've innovated and innovated. And, and I suppose they did it off, you know, under the radar to some extent or patiently to use your term. Um, because they, because again, they're formidable competitors and they run on other people's networks. And so they're, they're a little bit the same as Spotify in the sense that they're operating in a, in a space where they're, they're surrounded by very, very powerful players. And then would you also argue that they've got, business model leverage, i.e. they've now sort of established a really good unit of, of exchange and they, from there they can build and, you know, and, a, and, a, and a loyal customer base and scale and then a position where they can you know, start to layer on new product offerings and, and expand within their economic ocean. So I try to use many of your terms there as well. No, yeah, 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 yeah. I think that that's spot on, and I think it's true. It's true for both sides. If you think about their SMB customers again, because they can potentially drive so much demand to those customers because they're so deeply embedded in their workflows, uh, they yeah they have an opportunity to offer additional services um, over time. That again, they've they've got this captive audience. They don't need to acquire them for a huge cost or anything. They've got them right there, so they can just continue to upsell, and that's great. Um, and then yes, on the on the customer side, this sort of digital wallet, the cash app, the, the payments, sort of peer to peer stuff, is a great starting point. Um, but then they you know they get into areas like stock trading and um, other places like that where they can just keep kind of serving up. Uh, new services, new features, new products to these users uh, over time, and that whole flywheel just kind of keeps spinning. So, yeah, I mean, it, it sounds it sounds easy. It's certainly not easy, right? I, I think yeah. for any of these companies, there's massive competition from all sides for for a company like Square, but um, they certainly do sit in a pretty advantaged position. So, so Brett, I want to ask you also now about the shifting economics of distance. So, I'm gonna I'm gonna quote again to you from your, one of your essays. You said we are seeing for the first time an economic shock create a discontinuous divergence in the spatial economics, the cost of distance between the physical and the digital worlds. What did you mean by that? And also, you know, if you, if you don't mind, could you also talk us through this matrix this, that you've got? It puts people in quadrants based on positional s scarcity versus spatial economic impact of COVID-19. Because it's a, it's, a, it's a great um, diagram. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, so I think over the last 
few decades, we've sort of seen a broad-based decline in the cost of the cost of distance across you know digital and physical worlds. And it's you know cost of distance in kind of the physical world is it's you know cheaper to ship things. It's increasingly cheaper to travel all around the world. So doing things in the physical world uh, at a long distance is increasingly less expensive. Um, so that cost has been coming down. The cost of doing that from a digital perspective is coming down, you know, even faster. Uh, you know, it really hasn't been necessarily significant enough to break the status quo that's kept many things functioning as they have. I mean, the cost of delivering education or the cost of doing a business meeting digitally has uh, has gotten less expensive for, you know, higher quality over time. Um, but, you know, because of the fact that uh, the other pieces of that, the, the physical world side of it have also been declining in value. And because of the fact that, there is an element of positional scarcity to these things. There's uh, there's prestige tied into jumping on a flight and going to a business meeting, or there's prestige in uh, being on location at a university, getting your degree there. Uh, they really haven't decoupled, and and you know I think that the this pandemic situation has has totally decoupled those things from again health to education to to the way that we do business, and it's really broken down those things, and it's having a pretty you know, pretty significant impact on capital and attention flows. Um, I think you can sort of see this play out. You know, there's a, a really good tweet from Chamath Palihapitiya of Social Capital that talks about just the the different terms that uh, a company like Slack, who has significantly benefited by this rapid decoupling, and that what they were able to get as they went out to the markets to raise debt versus a company like Airbnb, who has been, you know, really, really challenged and and put in a tough position um, through all of this. And so, you know, the the quadrant that you're talking about or the the chart that you're talking about sort yeah. of looks at four different areas. So it's, you know, is a company negatively impacted by the spatial economic shifts of COVID-19? So those are, you know, on the negative side, you get things like uh, movie theaters or, you know, non-elite secondary education institutions. Um, and then on the positive side, you get uh, you get things like, you know, digital wellness and telehealth and teleconferencing and distance education and and things like that. Um, and then on the positional scarcity side, sort of high and low, it's uh, you know it, it again kind of comes back to is there uh, is there prestige or legitimacy tied up in uh, this activity? Is there a physical or regulatory monopoly around this activity? Are there network effects that will come back as we sort of start to ease away from this? And, you know, so the the four categories, if we kind of look at it, it's, uh, I've, I've bucketed it as, you know, there's a resilient recovery category, which is sort of this high it's level of position. Top left, right? In the, yeah, in the top budget. left. Exactly. Top left. And it's sort of high positional scarcity, high signaling value, high degree of assets that will be valuable over time. And that's things like you know, Airbnb or the NBA or Harvard. Those are things that will have a, a dip, but should recover pretty resiliently. Yes, yeah, so this is this bounce back category, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And then there's the there's the there's the side of that where, you know, an activity or a company has been negatively impacted, um, but does not have the benefit of prestige or legitimacy and has seen sort of significant brand impairment or, you know, a massive shift in the value chain get forced. And, and again, that's what I talked about a second ago with movie theaters and non elite institutions. There's the obvious growth category, which is these companies that have been positively impacted, but don't really have that positional scarcity or any kind of real signaling value. Um, and those, again, things things like Zoom, um, things like distance uh, distance medicine, et cetera, where you know, it's kind of obvious that those are going to grow. If you're already invested in those categories, great. If you're not already invested, you know, it's possible that sort of the valuation gap has sort of closed already on those things. Um, and it's not really clear where you know where the alpha is, so to speak, in there. And then there's, I guess, a, a new paradigm, and this is you know maybe hard to judge or hard to understand um, exactly where it plays out. But you know, places where there's a significant uh, gap between engagement and monetization, um, where companies have been you know positively impacted by spatial economics, where there is you know network effect developing or positional scarcity developing. Um, but the market hasn't quite caught up to that or understood that yet. Um, and again, who, who knows what this category is going to be? You know, if any of us knew that, we'd you know we'd be in a pretty good situation. But essentially, things like gaming and distance primary education fit into this category. But yeah, we'll we'll sort of see where that how that plays out. Fantastic, Brett. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. That's been a fantastic 
conversation. And, you know, I think not only have you, you know, have you opened our eyes to lots of different opportunities that maybe weren't, we weren't thinking about, but I think you've also given us a new vocabulary to talk about those opportunities. My, my last question to you before we, before we um, conclude is, where, where do people find your writing? How can they engage with you? Because I think you've also got a Telegram channel now, right? So Yeah. Yeah. So Twitter, I'm pretty active on there at Brett Bivens. Uh, I have a weekly newsletter that I put out where I talk about a lot of this stuff at uh, VentureDesktop.com. And then, like you said, I also have a Telegram channel where I more sort of high cadence thoughts, rapid thoughts on different things, share different links that I'm reading, uh, stuff like that. It's been a fun experiment to try to connect with some new people and and uh, share more thoughts in real time. So those are probably the three areas to uh, to connect with there. Brett, thank you so much indeed. Thanks, Ben. I appreciate the time. Thank you for listening to Structural Shifts by Aperture. To learn more about our Aperture community, visit aperturehub.co. We are strategy for the networked age. Until next time.